The following is a presentation of WSLS. History right here under my, under my nose and I knew nothing about it. The history of slavery. Imagine if I had known more. A stain on America. In Virginia, new stories of triumph are revealed. Men make slaves, but these people were more than just slaves. Descendants. And you see what kind of family we are, we love each other. <laughs> Making the most of a terrible sin. They allowed the slaves of Buffalo Forge to be able to create a sense of community and family. The way of life for enslaved people in Buffalo Forge that stood out from slavery across the country. It was a big center of industry for about 15 years. And one of those enslaved people. Garland Thompson's a legend in terms of his work ethic. His hard life in the 1800s producing a new purpose for his family today. He carried himself with dignity. And so this is what we, you know has been passed down through the generations. I think all of them got a piece of that mentality. You realize that it was a special group. Farther south, an unexpected reunion from the 1800s to the 21st century. But it had to be erected by someone, and I know who the labor was. A search for a dream spot to bring another family together. People say, oh, a plantation, why would you want to be on a plantation? Some would stay away. This Pennsylvania County family would not. I was able to come out here and, and see this massive property. Where slaves produced a major cash crop. They toiled and worked these, these, uh, these lands here for nothing. And now a hidden connection comes years in the making. As we uncover hidden history of two different families in Southwest Virginia. It is important that the children know the sacrifices of our ancestors. Tucked away in the rolling hills and mountains of Rockbridge County, off Winding Forge Road along the banks of Buffalo Creek, names that hint at the area's past. Sit the remnants of what was once a huge iron making and farming operation called Buffalo Forge. How many times have you been out here to the property? More than I can count. It's now a place Brando Branch, his cousin Jerry Thompson, and the entire family know well. They grew up in nearby Glasgow. It was a village because everybody was your mother and father and everyone looked out for each other. And heard family history passed down through generations. I had heard stories about, you know, different family members, grandparents and different things as a child, you know, but they were stories and, you know, you never really connected one to the other. But understanding how their family bonds are forged by fire here at Buffalo Forge came into clear focus when author and historian Charles B. Dew published this book, Bond of Iron. We really found out about it in the early 70s when Dr. Dew came here to research. He details the history of Buffalo Forge beginning in the early 1800s when businessman William Weaver bought it. The iron making and farming enterprise made him one of the wealthiest men in the area by the 1850s leading up to the Civil War. It was an amazingly lucrative uh, business. He made a fortune. That fortune built by slaves. Industrial slavery reigned in Virginia's forges and furnaces in the South where cotton was king. Weaver became the largest slaveholder in Rockbridge County, according to Dew. He had a total slave force of close to 70 men, women, and children in 1858. They were black people who were purchased to work the land and serve as skilled iron workers at the forge. 
There were slave houses all around, um, and these papers, these files are full of them. Buffalo Forge's dependence and connection to enslaved people is well documented. These were like duplexes, so you had uh, slave quarters on both sides. Weaver kept meticulous records as the business owner until his death in 1863. His nephew-in-law, Daniel Brady, continued the practice as the executor of Buffalo Forge. This is a sampling. There are about 25 boxes of, of materials. This treasure trove of documents with maps and pictures is kept inside Washington and Lee University's special collections and archives. They're housed in the James G. Laburn Library on campus in Lexington. Now down here is the stable. There's a, there was a post office, a granary, a mill, a corn crib. Both Weaver and Brady kept detailed house records that give insight into the way of life for slaves at Buffalo Forge. One name appears in them often. Garland Thompson's family is well recorded in those, in particular in the house book and in the ledgers. Garland Thompson, turns out, is the patriarch of cousins Jerry Thompson and Brandel's family. Something that struck me when I found out about Buffalo Forge was it put the stories in perspective and it made the family make sense. In Bond of Iron, Garland Thompson is described as an imposing figure of a man, courageous and unflinching, capable of remarkable feats of strength and workmanship, a legacy his family holds high. You know, Garland was a skilled laborer, a husband, a father, a grandfather. That's what he that's what we remember him for. And you know, and he was and he carried himself with dignity. The present day Thompsons believe his sense of dignity and self, even in bondage, grew from an uncommon occurrence. Was it an eye-opening moment when you learned that yes, there were some enslaved people who were able to earn some money? I was surprised and I was like, well, they were slaves, but I guess that was like a luxury. Of course, you had to treat your workers well if you wanted them to work, and, and that was, that forge work was something that you just couldn't get anybody to do. Weaver and Brady's papers show slaves could earn cash or credit at Buffalo Forge's store in exchange for extra work known as overwork. Once they finished their quota, they could work and earn money. They could have gardens and sell their vegetables. That was not common throughout the United States. The overwork ledgers reveal how the enslaved people spent their money, perhaps a glimpse into what they held dear at a time when they had little control over their fate. Here at Buffalo Forge, there's records well documented that Garland would buy some silk for his wife or went and bought some sugar. You know, everything was well kept of what they were able to do. So there was a sense of, you know, family. The Thompson family continued to grow in number at Buffalo Forge even after Garland Sr. was sold. Do rights, Garland's children stayed in the area, including Garland Jr. seen here with his own family. It's after the Civil War and the arrival of emancipation. Now free, they accepted contracts from Daniel Brady to continue work at Buffalo Forge. The book says Garland Thompson Jr. would continue to drive the charcoal wagon for $10 per month and rations of bread and meat. That wage is worth more than $300 today. Buffalo Forge is a place the Thompson family stayed connected to long after their ancestors were gone. But the story doesn't end there. <laughs> Not only did Buffalo Forge create a bond of fire and a bond of family. I'm trying to remember. Now, did I just come up there first trying to knock at the door? It also created a bond of friendship between Brandel and Susan Brady, a descendant of Daniel Brady, the next master of Buffalo Forge. When people come to visit and I'm, I'm showing them around and I say, well, these are slave, these were where slaves lived, it does not make me proud. She said growing up, there was little talk of the property's past when her grandparents later lived in the main house at Buffalo Forge. There were two brick buildings behind the house that were known as referred to as the slave quarters. And they were used as farm buildings at that point. There was no talk of it. There was no real discussion of history. 
And reading Dew's Bond of Iron was as enlightening for her as it had been for the Thompson family. The book is what I mostly, where I learned most of the history about it. And it was, it was eye-opening. And they were built in 1858, I think. Two brick slave cabins still stand at Buffalo Fords today, along with what was once a kitchen, what's left of a mill, and a few other buildings. For me just to be here and know that my ancestors probably walked these floors. It's a place Brandel visits often as he gains a greater understanding of the family legacy Garland Thompson started. If you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. And Garland gave us that. And it's the place Susan and her husband now call home. There were a lot of other um, housing, all kinds of things mm -hmm. before my time. Those are long gone, but one item remains. This is the ledger that was in the book. We kept accounts, 1860. It holds the tale of Garland Thompson, William Weaver, Daniel Brady, and how their families are forever intertwined in American history no longer hidden in the past. Some people want to get mad, some people want to get angry. You know, people scream reparations, blah, blah, blah. It's history. It is history and we have to learn from it and we have to move forward and we have to hug each other and love each other. And the hope is that more of that can come from sharing the Thompson Weaver Brady story. Just opening things up, a, a conversation, communication, friendships. I love that. Do you? Yes, I do. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I love that. The heroic actions of a slave are memorialized near Buffalo Forge in Glasgow. Frank Paget was a skilled boatman. He led four other men to save a stranded canal boat full of passengers in 1854. Heavy rains flooded the James River and Balcony Falls near Glasgow. In a heroic attempt to save the last passenger, Paget drowned in the rushing current. A captain was so moved by Paget's sacrifice, he ordered the construction of this granite obelisk to stand beside Lock 16 of the Blue Ridge Canal. It now stands here in Glasgow's Centennial Park. The Miller family needed a gathering spot and chose the Sharswood House. It could accommodate our huge family. And once on the ground, the start of a journey that will live with them forever. I was thinking maybe some old barns or something, storage cat, uh, storage buildings, old, those type things, um, but turned out to be a little bit more. The past of both the home and the family reuniting at Sharswood when Hidden History returns. Hidden History is proudly brought to you by Bank of Botetot. Southwest Virginia is full of rich history. The region is home to historical sites like the Natural Bridge in Rockbridge County, the Booker T. Washington Monument in Franklin County, and the Bloody Monday Marker in Danville. Virginia also has a lot of unknown history that sits right here in Gretna. Okay, this is the foyer of the original house. A house that Karen Dixon Rexeroth just so happened to see while running errands with her mom in the spring of 2020. She was shocked when she saw a for sale sign in the yard. So it always to me seemed like a, a old house that nobody resided in. Maybe a, one person lived in it, it's always stayed in, but I always called it a scary house. It may be a scary house with the special features like the gable finials on the roof. We learned the architect designed the white two-story house with a Swiss Gothic influence. Inside, there are diamond-shaped pane windows in every room, about 3,000, and the house Looks like a museum with furnishings and items from both the 18 and 1900s. Karen says the house smelled old at first, but the scent is mostly gone with the help of air fresheners and candles. In the parlor sits a couch, a piano from the 1800s, a desk, and a bookcase. And over in the dining room, there's a family table for six and this antique television in the corner. I wasn't sure what to expect, but of course it didn't come on. However, there are more treasures this house still holds. Karen was interested in the house because it could be a gathering spot. It could accommodate our huge family where we could have gatherings and parties. 
I mean, uh, we could we could do a lot with the house. And of course, these bricks was put up by hand back in the 1800s. Wow. Frederick, Karen's brother, put in a bid for the house from California. Got a call out of the blue from my sister one day, and the rest is the rest is history. Here we are. Fred always wanted to host family reunions and allow the family to gather in one spot with enough room. But the Air Force veteran didn't really want the gothic-looking house originally. He wanted to build a home from the ground up next to his mom's house. It was another family member who encouraged him to place a bid. My older sister is actually the one who really convinced me to do it. Um, my younger sister, Karen, I could have, you know, I, I was just going to blow that off. But <laughs> Any kind of, you know, notion where he was like, I can't, I won't be able to do that. I made it happen. Fred eventually put in a $225,000 bid for the house in March of 2020, just $5,000 more than the asking price. They didn't accept the bid. Really? No, they didn't accept it, so okay. I, was, I, was, I was happy about that. <laughs> yeah. The reason they turned it down? He's unsure. And he went about his life like normal over the coming months. That was until the sellers put the house back on the market. And Fred got another call from his sister Karen. He put in the same bid, $225,000, and this time, Fred got the house. I went into shock. <laughs> 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 because, I mean, because I mean, it, it, for me, it was like everything I was trying to do was not working. I mean, to, uh, to sabotage this thing, it was not working. So. But I saw past that. I saw, I mean, this was a great investment, even if he didn't want it. In the summer of 2020, Fred secured a place to meet for his family and includes more than 10 acres of land. It was this big, beautiful house here and a few outlying buildings. Um, it's what I saw. I mean, I just, it just said outlying buildings. I didn't know what they meant. I mean, I thought that, you know, it was a new part of a farm. I was thinking maybe some old barns or something, storage, cat, uh, storage buildings, those type things. Um, but it turned out to be a little bit more than that. Something more indeed. When Karen took another walk through the home with her keen eyes, she saw a photo of the Sharnswood house in this book called Pennsylvania Homes and People of the Past. And after a quick online search, she learned this Sharnswood home was originally a tobacco plantation on more than 2,000 acres. A Miller plantation? This was a plantation? Unbelievable. Unbelievable, because Fred's last name is also Miller. Nathaniel Crenshaw Miller originally owned the plantation. Fred's family wondered if their ancestors could have worked on the same land because of the last name, like Sarah Miller. And they had been always looking for uh, Sarah, which is my great-grandmother. I don't think so. Maybe we just, I mean, coincidence, yes, that, you know, we, we got the same last name. Karen kept researching and asked for help from a genealogist in Danville. Carice Luck Brimmer took on the task of finding out if Sarah Miller was enslaved on the same land her great-grandson Fred bought in 2020. Brimmer found her first piece of evidence while digging through old Pennsylvania County Courthouse records. For this family, um, I just think it was a move of God. You know, just the way it all came together, um, the way it happened. Brimmer says the labor contract connects David and Violet on the plantation among 58 slaves. David and Violet are Sarah's parents. Brimmer also went a step further by looking on FamilySearch.com. That's where old documents like the Slave Birth Index and an 1870 census are kept online. We also learned Sarah was born on March 10, 1868, two years after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. And she's the youngest of eight children, and she lived until the age of 80. So it's like rewarding, because that is like the number one thing that I want to find. I want to connect people to the ancestral home where their ancestors, where they lived, you know, where they worshiped, where they worked. So Fred and Karen now have at least two documents proving their great-grandmother, Sarah Miller, was on the same plantation they purchased as a family gathering spot. Wondering, you know, what, what around here did they touch? What did they touch? And, you know, they br was breathing the same, you know, <gasps> air and stuff that, that's around here. There's different things in the house that I often think about. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy because I think it comes with a whole lot of responsibility. I own this place that my ancestors was once enslaved. Coming up on Hidden History, Lost and Found. My people put that thing together and it's still standing. The remnants of slave life at Sharswood and the journey to make sure it's never forgotten.
Fred's sister Karen continues our tour through the Sharswood home, and we learned more details about how slaves at the Sharswood plantation entered the main house. They call it an English style basement. It simply means there's a window that you can see from um, outdoors. But you'll notice the um, actual wear and tear on the center of the stairs. Mm -hmm. And they say that's because, okay, the slaves, of course, could not enter the home through any of the doors. Karen tells us the slaves would enter through the cellar. They were not allowed to go through the front or back door of the home. On this tour of the cellar, we learn there are more pieces to history. This structure is the actual slave quarters. Yeah, slave quarters. It was the um, kind of served as a dual purpose, uh, slave quarters slash kitchen for the main house. Fred says the slave house is the oldest building on the property, dated in the late 1700s. They believe there was a single home at one time for, for a white family, and then later on they divided it into two for multiple uh, enslaved families there. The slave house surprisingly still stands with many features from the late 1700s. The quarters had a spot for slaves to cook and rest. While the quarters are old, it is still sturdy. Fred says through research he learned everything on the plantation was made there. There was a blacksmith that produced the nails that still hold parts of the structure in place. And there are even beams, which is pretty remarkable to Fred's engineering mind. The nails were made here, so you'll see they have handmade nails, the different kind of peg construction you'll see yeah. on this facility here. So it's a lot to learn if you were really into architecture and those type of things, especially some dated back to the 1700s. How's the engineering mind for you? Because you're, you're the engineering for you. Yeah, I look at this stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I take notice of it. And yeah. I, it, it amazes me how it still stands. And that's my whole goal to restore it and um, make it back to a, a place where people can come in and look around and tour from an architectural standpoint, if nothing else. And that's why Fred started a GoFundMe and a nonprofit called the Sharswood Foundation to raise money to restore the quarters and give the public a chance to walk and experience history. Another thing he wants to preserve is the Slave Cemetery. It's about a 15-minute walk northwest of the property. Out in the wooded area there, right off the, off the little dirt road. We also walked into the graveyard, hidden within this wooded area and covered with leaves and periwinkle. It's the forgotten burial site for black slaves who lived and worked on the Sharswood plantation. I checked the, uh, with the county, the deeds office over there. They, they said that this cemetery was um, fenced off. So this is one, and this is a stone here. I want to believe that this kind of marks one edge and, and the other side because I always find them as there's like a um, headstone and footstone per se. I've counted at least 30, wow. um, but there's possibly more in here. You see the indention here? Another indention. Covered by periwinkle. So what I try to do, I try to walk on the side of it so not to disturb it. I mean, I have mixed emotions every time I come out here. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I know where it is now and I can kind of do something about it. But at the same time, it saddens me because I feel like no one should be discarded like this. And when I see it, I, I see it as such. Because I, I see other uh, grave sites and cemeteries and those type things. And, they have proper markings and have all the things that's um, associated with respectful burials. Fred is hoping he can one day restore the slave quarters and gravesite so they are no longer a part of hidden history, but a chapter in American history for anyone who wants to learn. He and his family are now enjoying the same gathering spot that his ancestors like Sarah Miller used to live and work on. I think that this little small town here needs something of such uh, because so much happened here. A lot happened here in these little small towns, and a lot of um, the, uh, the bad things that happened in America started here. A lot of the good things that happened for America can start here. How much y'all cook? Food, fun, and laughter fills the rooms of the Sharswood home today. I'm family is everything to me. You know, good, bad, or indifferent family, and it's so important to me. Special requests for tours and Juneteenth celebrations are held on the well-kept property. And Fred says he hopes to turn this place into a museum and welcome all to discover the hidden history of the Sharswood Plantation. But when you come, you'll see it christened by the new millers in charge as the Sharswood Manor Estate.